God for the scripture that has already been read. I'm going to ask if you can turn back with me. Multimedia uh, has not been informed, so please, I apologize to them for not giving these scriptures beforehand. From uh, Genesis, the second chapter, the seventh verse, Genesis 2, 7. Genesis, the second chapter, the seventh verse. It would be fine just to listen. Then the Lord God formed man from the dust of the ground, and he breathed. Can someone say breathe? He breathed the breath of life uh, into the man's nostrils, and the man became a living person. And then if you can move to Ezekiel, the 37th verse, uh, and want to look at verse number 9, Ezekiel 37, 9. Then he said to me, speak a prophetic word to the wind, son of man. Speak a prophetic message and say, this is what the sovereign God says. Come, O breath from the four winds, breathe into these dead bodies so they will live again. So I spoke the message as he commanded me and breath came into their bodies and they all came to life and stood on their feet like a great army. And the people of God said, Amen. And then if you can move back to our scripture for today, uh, the, uh, John, the 20th chapter, wanting to look at verse number uh, 22. Then he, being Jesus, breathed on them, being the disciples, and said, receive the Holy Ghost. And the people of God said, amen. You may take your seats in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ. We ask for your sermon topic today as we use as a sermon topic, take it to the bridge. Can you look at somebody and tell them, take it to the bridge? Can you look at somebody else and take it to the bridge? Uh, some of you may have heard of a singer by the name of James Brown. <laughs> and he used to have a sidekick by the name of uh, Bobby Bird. And uh, Bobby Bird was uh, raised in the church, uh, played in the church with his uh, mother and father. And then once he started playing uh, R&B, the church didn't like it like so many of our R&B stars. And so he moved out of the church, uh, still had a gospel recording artist, but many of you know that he started a group called uh, Bobby Bird and the Flames, Fabulous Flames. And that's, he met James Brown, and James Brown was initially just a part of the Fabulous Flames. He saw the greatness of James Brown. James Brown became the leader and became James Brown and the Fabulous Flames. And uh, part of what they used to do on songs is when they would go from one part of the song to another part of the song, James Brown would say to Bobby Bird, take me to the bridge. And uh, we have the most anointed music director of any church anywhere in the country, <laughs> uh, Q Salters. And I'm just going to ask Q to just tell us a little bit about what take it to the bridge means musically. Can you give Q a hand praise? So the meaning of a bridge, a song goes in forms. You have the intro, you have a verse, you have a chorus, and you may even do another chorus after that. But now you have a bridge, which means you're taking it out. Bridge is taking it to the bound. And when Pastor asked me to do this, I, I kind of got a little stirred up with it because it it's really good. But I'm coming from a musical standpoint. Or a point. My wife is here, and she's coming from a spiritual standpoint. <laughs> and so when we were speaking this morning, pastor called us and said, what does it mean to take it to the bridge? And so I began to think of a song. There's the verse and you have a chorus. And many times in a song, the verse is what tells the story and the chorus is the part that repeats. But you get to a certain point of the song when you're tired of singing the verses and you're through with singing the chorus and you say, take it to the bridge. And take it to the bridge means it's time to go to that next place. And the bridge of the song, oftentimes there's a new melody. Sometimes the bridge doesn't sound the same as the verse and the chorus, so it takes some time to adjust. But in order to get to the vamp, you've got to take it to the bridge. And so even in our lives, God is calling us to take it to the bridge. And it's going to take faith. And we're going to not just have to speak faith, but we're going to have to walk this thing out. So it's time to take it to the bridge. In this season, somebody shall take it to the bridge. The doors of the church are now open. <laughs> Can you give brother and sister Salters a hand praise? Amen, amen, amen. They're our newest team couple in ministry now. 
Praise the Lord. Praise the Lord. Brothers, make sure you always remember this. Don't leave your wife out. Amen. <laughs> no, but thank you. Thank you so much, Sister Saucers. Thank you so much, too. So as you heard, Take It to the Bridge is one by which you're going from one place to another place. And for many of us, we all know that uh, on March 26th of this year, um, a ship by the name of Dolly uh, was coming, lost power, and wound up striking uh, the Francis Scott Key Bridge, and the bridge collapsed. And from that, sadly, uh, persons lost their lives, all of from Guatemala, Guatemala and uh, they were having lunch, or not lunch, they were eating uh, late at night, and so that's why they were in their cars, and the cars went into the uh, river. Uh, we can praise God for our governor, having been in office less than a year and the national attention on him. And for many of you remember that the Sunday before the election, he and the lieutenant governor and their campaign staff worship right here at Ebenezer, and you know he's a praiser, <laughs> amen. And uh, so I thank God for not only how he's handled it, uh, but he's how he's handled it in a very faith and a way, in a very uh, compassionate way as well. And so uh, many of us may not remember or know that the uh, Francis Scott Key Bridge is the ninth largest bridge in this, uh, or the port of Baltimore, the ninth largest port in this uh, country, it has over $80 billion worth of revenue. 15,000 people are directly employed by the bridge and by the harbor, and over 140,000 people are connected to, uh, their income is connected to the Port of Baltimore. So when the mayor of Baltimore spoke about uh, how this uh, port impacts the nation because there was some criticisms from some elected officials, he had to remind everybody that the Port of Baltimore not just affects Baltimore, but affects the nation. Yeah affects the nation as well. And we thank God for Juanse Fumbe, who is from the area in which the bridge collapsed. And we thank God for his leadership as well. So we all know what a bridge is. So when we look at a bridge, we can know that if you're on, the, on this side, praise God, I couldn't do this on Wednesday. <laughs> uh, when you're on this side of the Woodrow Wilson Bridge and you go over from the uh, Maryland side, the bridge ends uh, when you get on the Virginia side. And so the bridge takes you over the body of water, amen, that you could not have gotten over if there had not been a bridge. Somebody can say amen. amen. When I was younger, my parents and family, we used to travel from Hampton, Virginia to where our uh, grandparents lived in Cambridge, Massachusetts. And uh, we would go initially over the George Washington Bridge when we got into New York, but the traffic was so bad that they started going over the Trapeze uh, Memorial Bridge. And uh, we knew if you're 10, 12, 13 years of age, a 10 hour, 12 hour trip from Hampton to Boston, whew. But when we got to the Trapeze Memorial Bridge, that's when we knew we were almost there. And that feeling of crossing that bridge, knowing that we were soon going to get to where we wanted to go. There are bridges physically, but there are also bridges spiritually, as uh, Sister Salters let us know. And when your spiritual bridge collapse, you wind up staying where you are, wondering how you're going to get to the other side. Is anybody here like that today? You were wanting to cross from one place to another. In other words, you were in the midst of transition. You were getting ready to cross a bridge that you hoped was going to take you over, but the bridge you thought and hoped was going to take you over collapsed. And when it collapsed, you wondered how you were going to go and get to the other side. I come today to give you prayerfully what God has said to you if your bridge collapsed and how God can still get you over to the other side. Even if you're crossing and bridge over troubled waters. Talk to me, Aretha. <laughs> he will still get you on the other side. Anybody in transition today need to find out how God can get you on the other side. Look at somebody and tell them, take me to the bridge. Not a bridge, but take me to, make, make sure you emphasize T-H-E, the bridge. And if you know it for yourself, you can say amen, amen, and amen. 
The disciples now are very nervous. Matter of fact, they're scared to death. Uh, Jesus had told them to make sure they stay united, stay together, because he already knew what they were going to be going through was going to be very traumatic and troubling. So they are now in an upper room, and they have locked the doors. And they've locked the doors for good reason, because the same religious leaders who killed Jesus, they knew were probably wanting to kill them. Uh, the same Roman government that had killed Jesus, they knew were probably thinking about killing them, especially since the body was no longer in the tomb and they were the chief suspects. And the people who had killed Jesus also, they figured, might be killing them. So they were in the upper room, united with each other because they were in trouble. Can you look at your neighbor and tell them, I need you and you need me. Yeah, yeah. When you're going through something, I'm glad you're in church. I'm glad you're watching on streaming because you need unity in the church community. Do I have a witness in the house? And so they're in the upper room, nervous. Uh, Peter and John have gone to the tomb. They really don't know where Jesus is. Mary Magdalene has told them that he's not there. And so they're really scared because for the first time in three years, they are literally, they think all by themselves. And so as they are fearful, as they're scared, all of a sudden, Jesus comes in the room. The doors are locked. And I know with you, those of you who have inquisitive minds, you're asking how. Well, there's some answers that you don't get the answer. And I know many of you are very smart, very intelligent, but part of our humanness is we have to sometimes get to a point and realize we will never know. All we know is that he showed up. Do I have anybody? You don't know how he did it. All you know is he showed up. One time, Reverend Porter and I were driving uh, from Baltimore on the uh, 295, Baltimore Washington Parkway, and uh, it was snowy. Car started skidding. There was no guardrail. We were headed to the side of the road, going down a little uh, steep uh, cliff. And uh, we just hollered out together, spontaneously, Jesus! And I don't know how we did it. All I know, the car straightened up. Reverend Porter looked at, and I looked at each other and said, we know it's Jesus. Anybody know you were headed for a major accident and the, whoo, God made a way? I had just been finishing preaching a Monday, Thursday service at St. Mark. Episcopal Church in Boston, Massachusetts, Brother Burke, and uh, with that, I, it was raining, and I was driving home, and uh, all of a sudden, uh, she looked like she was about eight years old, just darted right out in front of the car on Blue Hill Avenue, and uh, I don't know how the car did not hit her. I don't know if you almost missed just hitting somebody, especially a child. I mean, she was literally inches from the car. I was probably going 20 miles an hour, and how the angel of the Lord came and stopped the car. I don't know. All I know is that he did it. Anybody know that you don't know how it happened? All you know that God showed up right in the nick of time. The disciples needed Jesus and Jesus showed up. Anybody need Jesus this morning? I, I just come to let you know he's going to show up in ways you could never think or imagine. And so as he showed up, the disciples who were in trouble, the disciples who were traumatic, the disciples who were going through such anxiety. It's interesting, Jesus showed up and said, "Assalamu alaikum, peace be with you. And as he said, peace be with you, you he, they had left him during the crucifixion. When he needed those boys the most, his main men, they, they left him. And so he, he should have been mad. He should have been upset. He could have rebuked them and said, here I was at my most important hour. Peter, you denied me three times. Everybody else except John, you weren't even there. But instead of rebuking him, he loved them. And he said, peace be with you. Those of us who remember uh, Lenten services, remember the John the 14th chapter, let not your heart be troubled. Your situation stays the same, but don't discount how God can give you peace in the midst of your trouble. Some of us are asking for the situation to change before our heart situation changes. But God will give you peace 
while the situation is still the same, to let you know something's getting ready to happen. Do I have somebody that, of all, I know you want money, I know you want this, I know you want that, but never discount how God can give you a precious gift that even if you were a billionaire, you could not buy, and that's peace. Has anybody ever received it? From the Lord. Uh, when Pastor Joe and I were thinking about uh, wondering what our future was going to be like, and uh, we had been unemployed for about nine months, it was getting really challenging and difficult. Um, I was sitting on the end of the bed. It, it wasn't the radio, it wasn't any music coming to my ear, but God sent a song. Hold on a little while with Thomas Whitfield. What a friend we have. Hold on a little while longer. These heavy burdens will soon be passed. Run the race. Keep it. Hold on. Don't you ever let go. Let my Jesus lead you. I guarantee you know. He'll lead you in a way by which you know even though the road is rough and the going gets tough, you've got a friend. I was sitting on the edge of the bed. My situation had not changed. But something happened on the inside to let me know God was going to make a way somehow. Ah, I had gotten a staph infection in my knee in the hospital. I've told this story before. I was mad at every nurse, every doctor that there could be. I apologize. I wasn't the spiritual pastor I should have been. <laughs> Brother Brown got me in touch with a lawyer that was very well known for getting medical uh, suits through, Brother Petty. And so I called him. I went off. I had 10 pages of notes, all the wrong things. I didn't even say hello. And uh, he said, uh, Pastor, I, I know you're upset, uh, but are you alive? <laughs> he said, chances are if you're alive, you're not going to win the suit. And then he said, can I pray for you? I, I, I got <laughs> Normally, I'll say that first. <laughs> but he said, and then he started talking in tongues. This is a lawyer. And after he finished, the situation was the same, but I saw it changed. And after that, I threw away the papers. I got my anger was gone, and know what happened? The head of food services was a member of Ebenezer. So I was eating all this junky food, but now I was getting steak. <laughs> uh, Dr. Arden got the head nurse in, everything. And by that weekend, I was home. Somebody says, amen. Sometimes before the situation changes, you have to change. And God will give you a peace to let you know that better is coming. Do I have a witness in the house? So Jesus told the disciples, peace, assalamu alaikum, peace be unto you. And the disciples' disposition changed. Something happened within them and they began to realize that everything was going to be all right. And, and, and with this peace, the Bible says that Jesus, in a loving and a very caring way, let them know, I'm going to breathe on you. Yeah, yeah. The breath of God, sometimes it's not even the breath of God. Sometimes it can be your breath in which God is in it. Uh, when our grandson uh, was born, our daughter had to have three um, blood transfusions because they tried to give birth while the baby was breached. And so Pastor Joanne had to be with our daughter uh, the father, our son-in-law, had to be with uh, his daughter, our do granddaughter. And so I was the one that had to stay with uh, baby Andre for about four days while he was in intensive care. And so I was just holding him in my arms and uh, just saying, everything's going to be all right. But while I was doing that, I was breathing on him. And by his stripes, you're going to be healed, breathing on him. Sometimes God will have you hold things, hold persons, and you don't even realize it, but the breath of God is flowing through you to them. That's why you can't have al alcoholic breath. That's why you can't have drug breath. That's why you can't have non-spiritual breath. Because at that moment, whoever you're praying for, they need to feel the breath of God. Amen? But I want you to know, I'm a grown man. <laughs> Brother... <laughs> I, I don't want another man holding me. <laughs> he can breathe on me all he wants, but no, I, I, I don't rock me in your bosom, Jesus. No, I, don't, I, I ain't looking for that. No, I, I'm looking for a coach. I'm looking for somebody who's in the middle of the huddle. 
that's going to breathe on me in a different way. Can I get about 12 brothers just to come to the uh, altar? And I'm going to, I wish I could go over this, but I can't. And uh, thank the Lord. Oh, oh look. Uh, and so, uh, come quickly, brother. Like, we're getting ready to go into the game. Praise the Lord. We're getting ready to go into the game. And uh, everybody put your hand up like the, the coach has coming. No, no, like you hold hands, not hold hands, but grab hands like you're getting ready to go out to the game. Amen. And some coaches will say, oh, say Ebenezer, one, two, three. Ebenezer. They didn't inspire me. <laughs> I need a coach that'll be able to, we're going to win this game. We're in our home court. We're in our home field. There's no way we're going to win. And the name of our team is Jesus. That means no weapon formed against us is going to prosper. And when the game is over, the battle is not ours, but it's the Lord's. So when the game is over, I guarantee you, we're going to win in Jesus' name. Put your hands up. One, two, three. Jesus. Jesus. See the difference? Can you give the brothers a hand praise? I need somebody that's going to breathe victory on me. I need somebody that's going to bring power on me. I need somebody when the game has not even started that I'm going to get into the game and this is the game of life. I know that I'm more than a conqueror through him that loves us. Do anybody need a coach by the name of Jesus this morning? Can you give somebody a holy high five and say, we got this. I don't care what the odds look like. We've got this. I don't care how difficult it may seem. We've got this. I don't care if the team we're facing is undefeated. We've got this. For greater is he that's in us than he that's in the world. I don't need to be rocked in these moments. I need to be encouraged and have power in these moments. Do I have anybody who came to church today? Because the church is the upper room. And Jesus told his disciples, I, I'm going to ask and give you a mission. Every born again believer ought to have a Holy Ghost fire baptized mission. That you're not just going to a job, you're going to a mission. Because you're a Christian, everywhere you go, you bring Christ with you. And the job you have, God didn't give it to you just to make an income. God gave you a mission. Just as some of the companies you work for have a mission statement. You ought to have a mission statement for what God has for you in your life. So every morning you wake up, when you go to work, there's a mission that you have already seen God put on you, that God is going to be working through you. And we got to give the Lord's name to pray. So there's a teacher from Ebenezer who had a mission statement. She realized that 75% of the students at the school were on food, uh, food assistance. So she started a food bank at the school. She saw that after lunch, they were still hungry. And so teachers and anybody from the community could bring food to her food bank. And the students could come in, fill up bags of food, and take it home. That became her mission. She wasn't there just to teach, but she started a food bank. We have a member of the church who was a lawyer. For over 14 years, pro bono, he made sure that the state of Maryland became clear that what they had done to the black colleges was illegal. In over 15 years, I thank the Lord for Brother Michael Jones. He won the suit against the state of Maryland for $1 billion. They settled for $570 million. And anybody who's gone to a black college in Maryland knows that they have benefited from the fact that Brother Jones saw what his mission was as a lawyer. Do I have a witness? You can be a student. In the 1980s, uh, there were friendly high schools moving from virtually all white to all black. One of our students saw that the mascot, the patriot, was still white. He said, I'm going to color it black. <laughs> and we thank the Lord that it became a black patriot. Some students at, at that time, Roger B. Tani, uh, middle school, said, we can't be going to a school that was named after the one who said we have no rights that anybody ought to respect. Would Jewish kids go to a school by the name of Hitler? So why would we go to a school by the name of Roger B. Tanny? They did the research. They did, and they went to the school board, pressed their case. And 300 brothers from Ebenezer sat in on the school board meeting to make sure they knew we weren't playing. <laughs> and from that, Roger B. Tanny is now Thurgood Marshall Middle School because students had a mission. The question is, when you... 
persons who worked for the federal government, their agency was near a local school. They adopted the school. And the members of the persons who worked in the federal government made sure that that school had what they needed so that all that they needed, those members at that job were provided for. That became their mission. I'm just asking a simple question. When you go to work, have you thought about what your mission is besides just going to work and making money? Have you thought about your mission where you live in the community where you live? Have you thought about your mission when you go to school every single day? Have you thought about what does God have me to do while I'm here? And if you haven't thought about it yet, get ready! For God's going to use you to turn this world upside down and right side up. And he told the disciples, I'm getting ready to give you a mission. The same mission that God, my Father, gave me, I'm now getting ready to give you. But you can't fulfill it unless I breathe on you. Unless I take you to the bridge. Unless I bring you from where you are, because right now you're in transition. You, you, you were here before, I, I, you were here with me, and now I'm no longer going to be with you. But I'm going to give you a bridge that you'll be able to cross over to the other side. And when you cross over to the other side, the same power that you see in me is the same power that I'm going to give you. Uh, I'm going to breathe on you. I'm, I'm going to breathe the Holy Spirit. Don't think you can do this mission without the Holy Spirit. Don't think you're wise enough, strong enough to do it. You better make sure that God is with you on your side. Because you don't want to just feel like it. You better make sure that the Lord has made you do it in his name. Uh, uh, several years ago, the choir started singing. The Holy Ghost came down. I was in my office, and I felt like running. I should not have run. My knees, and the doctor told me not to run, but I just felt like running. I didn't pray, I, and so I was in my office, ran down that little hallway here. My daughter was watching on TV. She said, oh, no, Daddy's getting ready to run. And she hollered at the TV, don't run, Daddy. Now, Pastor Joanne didn't see me at first, and so I started running. And I didn't, I didn't, I'm being transparent. I didn't, I didn't ask the Lord. I should have, but I didn't ask the Lord. And you don't notice it, but there's a little ramp right when you get to that end there. And so I'm running full speed. I've got to stop. But have you ever tried to stop running full speed when there's a ramp? And I stumbled, and I should have hit that rail. And I would have been very embarrassed if you had to call the ambulance and Pastor Joanne would have had to preach and everybody would have spent Sunday morning praying for Pastor. I'm trying to be, I, 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 I didn't, I didn't, I, I didn't ask him. I just felt like it. Uh, the men, the young men were coming back from a um, young men's retreat. Reverend Tony Lee was our minister to youth. He was standing right here. The brothers was there and he jumped into the crowd of brothers and started body surfing. I said, wow. I've never body served. I didn't pray about it. I just saw it. And Reverend Lee was just, Ooh. I said, and then I looked at Pastor Joanne, and she looked at me, you better not. <laughs> I, I thank God because Reverend Tony Lee at that time probably weighed 98 pounds. I weighed 298 pounds. And I can see the young brothers just, Look at somebody pray before you do it. Be because it feels good, because you feel like it may not be God. Remember the devil told Jesus, jump from this cliff and God will send angels to protect you. And Jesus said, do not tempt the Lord thy God. And from that, every now and then, you got to be prayerful. Be prayerful before you go into that relationship. I, I know he's acting spiritual the last two weeks because he knows you go to church and it's Easter and Mother's Day and Father's Day. But, be, but pray about that, brother. <laughs> and because after Mother's Day ends, he may not come back to church again until next Easter. Pr pray about that, sister, brother. Yeah, I, I know she wants you, but does she want the Holy Ghost that's with you? P pray about that situation. Pray. Pray about that job. I know it looks good on the outside, but God may not have that job for you and he might have something. But pray about that situation. Whatever you're getting, business interaction, that business relationship, pray about it before. The worst thing to do is get in it and then try to get out of it. Am I talking to somebody today? Because it feels good does not mean it is good. Can you look at somebody and say, Lord, give me a praying spirit. So Jesus said in order for you to go forward, 
You've got to receive the Holy Ghost. And the Holy Ghost is going to give you power. And he was going back to Genesis where man was, a, was just there in the garden. But God breathed into his nostrils the breath of life. And man became a living soul. Do I have any living souls in the house today? Because God has taken you from that bridge to another. With Adam, he was in the garden but didn't know his purpose. And when God breathed into him the breath of life, he went from a period of transition to knowing what God would have him to do. But because he felt like it, he and Eve ate from that tree of the knowledge. And because of that, he messed up. You better pray before you do anything that God has given you ready to take you to the next level. In Ezekiel, there was a valley of dry bones. And in that valley of dry bones, the Israel army had just been defeated. When the Bible says dry bones, it means that they had been dead for a long time. Dry bones means that the vultures had started to, to eat all over us. I saw a deer right up the street. Vultures, you don't realize how big vultures are until you get on. The, the vultures were eating the deers. It, it's a terrible thing to see. And for the Israelites, it's important to have a proper burial because they have to bury a, a dead body within 24 hours. And because these bones were dry, Israel was even going through greater heartbreak and heartache because they had not been able to bury the dead. And so there was a valley of dry bones and, and all these dry bones and and God said to Ezekiel, can these bones live? And Ezekiel said, God, you never ask a question that you don't have the answer for. And God told Ezekiel, that's a good answer. I want you to know, I want you to speak to these bones. Somebody here today, after you pray, start speaking to your situation. By his stripes, I'm healed. Can you look at somebody and start speaking to your situation? I'm getting this job in the name of Jesus. Start speaking to your situation. My marriage shall be made right in the name of Jesus. Whom God brought together, let no man set asunder. Speak to your situation. He is my rock and my staff. Speak to your situation. He's the lily of my valley, the bright and morning star. When storm clouds come over, speak to your situation. This storm is passing over. Hallelujah. Whatever you're going through, I want you to speak to that situation and it might sound crazy but God has given you power in your speech he told Ezekiel speak to these dry bones don't just look at them don't just google them speak to your situation and see what God's getting ready to do can you give a neighbor a holy high five and say speak to it God has given you power speak to it don't back up from what God has for you. Speak to it. And when Ezekiel started speaking to it, the first thing you heard was a rattling. Before you cross over whatever bridge you need to cross over, you feel some rattling. You feel some shaking. You feel God getting ready to move. And that lets you know something good is about to happen. Something God is getting ready to take place. Does anybody feel a rattling? in the house. That's why God brought you to church today. Because every time you come to service, there ought to be a rattling before the word comes forth. There ought to be a rattling. The choir doesn't sing good just because they've rehearsed. The choir doesn't sing good just because the musicians have a gift to take bring voices out. I'm like Bobby Bird. Whatever we do, it's got to be anointed. God says in his house, it's got to be anointed. The music may sound good, but it's got to be anointed. The choir may sound good, but it's got to be anointed. And when the anointing of the Holy Ghost fills the house of God, you'll feel a little fire burning. You'll feel a little prayer will turning. You'll feel the anointing. You'll feel the rattling. And that lets you know something's getting ready to happen. Can you give a neighbor a holy high five and said it hasn't come yet? I haven't seen it yet, but I feel a rattling. I feel an earthquake. I feel something moving. I feel God moving. I feel the earth moving. I feel the Holy Ghost moving. Anybody came to church not just to be here because of the right thing to do, but you want to feel a rattling. And then after the rattling took place, the Bible said God took the bones and started putting the bones together. And then he took the muscles and started putting the muscles together. And then he took the flesh and put flesh over the bones and the muscles. But man, the valley was not living just yet. Somebody here today, God is preparing you 
to cross over to the other side. Can you look at somebody and tell them, take me to the bridge, but don't get there yet until the Holy Ghost tells you to move, tells you to go, and then all of a sudden, God told Ezekiel, breathe on these bones, and the breath of God, the ruah of God, the spirit of God, is like the wind. You may not see it, but you see trees blowing, you see grass moving, yeah, it's like the breath of God. You would be nothing unless God breathed into you the breath of life. God said breathe on these bones. And then all of a sudden, the rattling stopped. And all of a sudden, the bones came connected. The flesh came connected. The muscles came connected. And they rose up like a mighty army. Get ready. God's getting ready to take you to the bridge. You may have come in in a season of transition. Things may have seemed dead. Things may have seemed lost. But get ready. God's getting ready to do exceedingly and abundantly beyond what you can think or imagine. Yeah. How do I know the disciples were in the upper room? But I'm so glad Jesus was the bridge over troubled waters and it took them from the upper room to Jerusalem. Pastor, what happened in Jerusalem when the day of Pentecost came? I heard a mighty rushing ruah and the Holy Ghost fell upon the people with with anointing, with love, with peace, with joy, with healing. Get somebody and give a holy high five and tell them, God, take me to the bridge. I've been on this side long enough, but eyes have not seen it, and ears have not heard and my mind can't comprehend what God is getting ready to do. Look out. God is getting ready to have you cross over to the other side. Yeah. And when you get there, you'll feel like shouting. You'll feel like praising. You'll feel like giving God all the honor, all the praise and all the glory yeah cause when you look back over your life you will know that if it had not been for the Lord on your side you would have never made it over yeah thank you Sister Salters for letting us know that a bridge gets you over to the other side, can you give seven people a holy high five and tell them this Sunday is the Sunday God's taking me to the bridge, not a collapsed bridge, but a bridge over troubled waters and hallelujah, I'm going to make it over to the other side. And if you know that for yourself. Can you give the Lord's name the honor, the praise, and the glory? Yeah, Bobby, what we gonna do now? I don't know, but whatever we do, it's got to be anointed. And when the breath of the Holy Ghost gets on you, he'll take you to the other side. Can we stand all of the church? Hallelujah. Hallelujah.